Reform Subcommittee hearing on methamphetamine trafficking and abuse. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 2. Chairman Osi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is a pleasure to be here today. We have joining us on this panel a representative of the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department who has a long and illustrious career, and it is an honor to get the opportunity to introduce him for the purpose of testimony. Uh, Bill Kelly is a captain with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, and he's been with the county for 24 years. Prior to that, he served his country as a member of the Marine Corps. He has a law degree. Uh, his experience with the county is not strictly limited to narcotics, but he has had a wide exposure and experience to all of the various requirements of local law enforcement. And I just want to step through some of those. He served as a patrol deputy. He's also been involved in the operations side of the department. He was one of the select few that is uh, chosen to serve on our county's SWAT team. And he has now, and for uh, the past period of time, been the chief of the Sacramento County Narcotic, Sacramento County Sheriff's Department Narcotics Division. He has a good background, a solid record of performance. His testimony, I'm sure he'll share with us. He does us all a favor, Mr. Chairman, of speaking plainly and directly to the issues we face on methamphetamine in particular. I'm pleased to welcome to our witness table on this panel Captain Bill Kelly. Thank you very much, Congressman. I hope I can live up to that uh, introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, having me here today. And on behalf of uh, Sheriff Lou Blanis, the Sacramento County Sheriff, uh, he uh, sends his uh, regards to this committee and to uh, Congressman Osi. Good morning. I'm uh, Bill Kelly. I'm a captain with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. I command the uh, Sheriff's Department Narcotics Unit. I'm also the uh, <clears throat> director of the California Multi-Jurisdictional Methamphetamine Program. Um, in September of 2001, specifically, the state of California recognized that there was a need to address the methamphetamine problem from the local level. The legislature and the governor, uh, upon lobbying by the sheriffs, committed uh, $60 million over a three-year period to develop frontline law enforcement uh, effort to combat methamphetamine production distribution. And uh, we created the uh, CalMet program. Essentially what that did is paid some personnel costs from the state level, whereas the HIDAs uh, did not pay the personnel costs, which run about 80 to 85 percent <laughs> of any program. Personnel costs are just downright expensive. We can buy equipment. Um, it's always nice to be able to get the money for equipment, but it's the personnel money and the personnel cost for frontline law enforcement uh, that's really important to uh, um, any local agency. Local area law enforcement are pretty much charged with uh, the principles of uh, education, enforcement, and uh, treatment within the uh, narcotic community. We don't do much in the treatment program other than enforce the laws and introduce uh, those who are arrested into the uh, um, court system whereby for the users, uh, the drug courts have come into, uh, into focus and they assist these, uh, these individuals who are the users uh, in getting back to their lives. Law enforcement uh, in Sacramento County um, has found that there's a, a huge distribution level and production level of methamphetamine, uh, specifically because part of our county is rural um, and because we have major roadways and thoroughfares that transition the state, specifically the I-5 corridor. Um, I'll bring to light a couple of different uh, recent uh, investigations that we had um, that should focus a little bit on uh, the production and the distribution of methamphetamine within the state of California. Um, we recently had uh, one case uh, just last week where we took down a super lab uh, just north of Sacramento County. There were 17 pounds of methamphetamine um, destined for Atlanta, Georgia. So not only did we produce the methamphetamine in the state of California, but we're also a major source of exportation of it. Um, we've also found that uh, 
it's a polydrug culture in a lot of sense. When they can't distribute their methamphetamine, they will distribute other narcotics. Uh, in two of our most recent methamphetamine investigations, uh, we seized 115 pounds of cocaine and 144 pounds of cocaine, in addition to substantial uh, numbers of methamphetamine. So it's a polydrug culture. These people are in business to distribute narcotics. Um, the large-scale organizations, the drug trafficking organizations, um, they, they're not users. Uh, they market their product to the society. They don't use it themselves. They're in the business of marketing and making money. Local law enforcement, specifically at the city and at the county, are the law enforcement uh, most prepared and most identified uh, to address uh, a specific need within a community. Um, there's always inherent problems in policing a community. You're always going to have burglaries. You're always going to have robberies. You're always going to have vandalism. But when you get a product such as methamphetamine that um, is, uh, is produced in large quantities and distributed throughout the United States, local law enforcement needs assistance. And that's why we appreciate uh, the, uh, the House's uh, consideration of the bill and um, making available, hopefully, funds to local law enforcement to assist them in um, addressing these problems in the future. Um, again, uh, on behalf of Sheriff Blanis, uh, I thank you. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. I'm going to go ahead and introduce the next two witnesses. I'll let Congressman Baird, uh, if, he, if he gets uh, here, then sing your praises with more detail. But we appreciate very much uh, uh, Chief Meritech from the Vancouver, Washington uh, Police Department and Sheriff Lucas from Clark County, which is Vancouver West, is it, uh, towards the coast? Would that be Clark or north? Actually, east and east. west and north, yes. Okay, so all around, and Vancouver's the center of, of that county. Does it go to Longview? Vancouver sits in the lower southwest corner of the county. Okay. So. Um, but we thank both of you. We've heard about the Washington State problem, and are looking forward to hearing your testimony, and then we'll ask questions and draw it out a little further. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chief Maritech? Martinek. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I am uh, Chief Brian Martinek, uh, the chief of the Vancouver Police Department, as, as our mayor likes to refer to it, America's Vancouver. So, and uh, we don't want to be confused with Canada's Vancouver, but with the 2010 Olympics coming, come to our Vancouver anyway. Spend your money there. Um, but anyway, it's it, it, indeed an, uh, a, a pleasure to be here and an honor uh, to be able to testify on what is a major problem in our area and across the United States, obviously, after hearing some of the testimony. Methamphetamine, un unlike most common illegal drugs that are abused, like heroin and marijuana and cocaine, uh, has a negative impact on our society in every stage of its existence, from its manufacture to its distribution and to its uh, uh, use of it. It is different in that fashion. It has a negative impact of this drug, has tentacles that can often and do and do often reach every level of our society. And I think that's the important focus for uh, all of us to remember when we're trying to address this problem. It is multi-dimensional, as the captain was pointing out. There are more things that uh, related to this drug in terms of its negative impact than within most of the others. The drug's use, distribution, and manufacturing is a problem with multidimensional consequences affecting men, women, and children. It knows no cultural or ethnic boundaries. It affects people, businesses, teachers, homeless, doctors, lawyers, the justice system, police, and public officials are all dealing with its effects. Whether we are using it or not, it affects us. And I think that's what I've heard consistently with every group that's um, talked here today. And um, what I would hope we would look at is a uh, multi-dimensional uh, strategy for um, ridding our area of it. What In my 18-year career, including uh, six years specifically assigned to a, law, uh, a drug task force, um, starting in the early 90s, we saw methamphetamine as a predominantly domestically controlled uh, drug that has now, in, in a very short period of time, taken on international um, competitive nature. 
Um, th this drug is indeed uh, an internationally uh, marketed drug and supplied drug. Um, as a law enforcement officer, I've seen the drug involved in every part of the law enforcement field. Murder investigations over meth lab businesses um, where one person was killed simply because of a marketing difference and how they were going to market and sell their product. Businesses affected by the direct result of employees being on methamphetamine and using it while they're working. Labs and apartments and hotels and, and vehicles, um, which affects every part of society in that labs blow up. Um, you don't have scientists running these labs. You have people who don't know what they're doing and that are oftentimes high when they're doing it. Burglary, fraud, theft, and other property crimes skyrocketing as a direct result of sometimes organized groups of methamphetamine-connected criminals. I think it was interesting to hear the captain talk about the multitude of uh, different activities that these groups take on. It is not just drug trafficking. Organized groups in our area, in our region, I'm, and I know that this is um, happening on the West Coast, are organizing people who are using methamphetamine to <coughs> steal people's identities and use that information to make money, and eventually that money is put back into the methamphetamine purchasing part of the business. Theft and other computer technology aided and enhanced crimes are often connected with our search warrants and arrests of people who we serve search warrants on for methamphetamine. Seventy-five percent of the Clark County prosecutor's felony drug caseload involves methamphetamine. A major uh, portion of the people uh, booked into the Clark County Jail have tested positive for methamphetamine. Police records show a 32% rise in the use of methamphetamine in our area over a, a th only a three-year period. I just had a conversation with one of our mental health professionals who told me that there's a significant rise of assaults on medical staff, including mental health workers in emergency rooms across our region, directly attributed to methamphetamine users who are going through violent phases of the use of the drug. Its spread has gone from a predominantly West Coast presence to being prevalent around the United States, including the Midwestern sections and parts of the East and Southern United States. It is quickly becoming the number one drug problem in the United States because of its multidimensional effects. And I would say that if you don't have it in your state or you don't have a significant problem, you will. And that's based on experience from talking to other chiefs across the United States. One of the focuses I hope this group will take and this legislation can help address is the environmental concerns because of the chemicals um, that, is dump that are dumped into the sewers, the watersheds, and the streams of our areas. It is a fact that the uh, end waste product of meth labs is um, responsible for contaminating not only homes and businesses and apartments and motels, but is also being dumped into our wildlands. Um, into our public parks and into our national parks. We find a, on a regular basis uh, meth labs, small and large, that have been dumped into different areas of our, our uh, region. The average cost of a meth lab cleanup for law enforcement in our area is between five to $10,000. I need to point out that that's the, that's the law enforcement cost for cleanup. The next cleanup process is that of the owner of the residence, and I heard some talk about uh, judges assigning um, uh, the suspects a uh, task to pay back for what they've caused in damage. That rarely happens. Um, without DEA funding and training, we would be severely uh, under, under uh, budgeted for the cleanup alone. The other effect that it has, though, is that the owners in most states, the owners of the property where the meth lab was at, are responsible for the eventual cleanup of that, that residence before anyone can move back into it legally. There is a big impact on owners. Last year in the state, or in 2001 in the state of Washington, we had over 1,300 meth labs. Last year, as you saw from the DA, DEA's numbers, we had 1,450 meth labs. We absolutely need a multidisciplinary approach to the strategy for the elimination of methamphetamine uh, from our communities. Prevention, interdiction, treatment, and a strong chemical precursor control and law enforcement legislation is needed. We need to ramp up our ability to control precursors both in the United States and coming from outside of the United States, as we heard of the example from Canada, um, before we're going to get control of these large 
uh, super lab type organizations that are running that methamphetamine up the coast. We share the I-5 corridor with the, the captain's agency and I think that is one of the reasons in answer to the question of why there's so many high numbers on the west end of the United States and then going across to the Midwest. The U.S. government can help local communities most by supporting and maintaining appropriate funding, legislation, and personnel support to our mission. In our southwest region of uh, Washington State, we have no um, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office or federal court, and we don't have a strong presence and staffing of law enforcement federal agents there because we're, we're in between a sort of a barrier with the Portland District U.S. Attorney's Office and the Seattle District being uh, 130 miles away from us. Uh, it, it causes some logistical issues that doesn't always get us the kind of law enforcement uh, assistance that we need. Having said that, uh, the Western U.S. Attorney John McKay is doing a great job of starting to improve that process for us, but it is something that we do need some very, very much uh, long overdue help from the federal side in terms of law enforcement. We are not going to win the war against this epidemic or any drug epidemic without the cooperation and collaboration of the federal justice system. That's just the fact of, of the way this system works up, especially when you're trying to go to the top end uh, distributors. Lack of federal courts in our area has been a problem for us. We, however, do uh, really appreciate the support that we have had um, in terms of the burn grants and HIDA funds. And uh, recently, we were awarded $225,000 out of the Department of Justice COPS Fund um, to do some uh, methamphetamine research and strategy uh, project that would give us a better idea of what the effects in our local community. Vancouver has 150,000 people. Clark County altogether has about 350,000. We want to involve the community as we do in other areas of law enforcement um, so that they are a part of coming up with this solution because, again, in closing, um, to make any strategy work, we have to, it has to be a multidimensional, multidisciplinary approach that includes prevention, includes treatment, legislation, and enforcement, and the community has to be a part of that strategy or it's not going to work it won't be safe for people to come and help us unless we have the leaders of the community, both formal and informal, speaking up and being a part of the solution. So I thank you again for this opportunity, and um, if there's anything else we can do, we'd be glad to be a part of it. Thank you very much. Sheriff Lucas? I'm Chairman Souter, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Gary Lucas. I'm the Sheriff of Clark County, beginning my fourth term and my 36th year of law enforcement service with the, with the County of Clark. Uh, our methamphetamine problem began in the mid-1970s, so we've been wrestling with this issue for some time. In a recent series of four articles by the Vancouver Columbian on the methamphetamine problem in Clark County, one official described it as being of epidemic proportion. The abuse of methamphetamine is growing rapidly within our communities and across the country. If it isn't a problem in your community now, it will be. Meth methamphetamine abuse is pernicious, it is extremely addictive, relatively easy to produce, gives an intense, long-lasting high, and is cheaper on the street than heroin or cocaine. The chemicals used to produce meth are poisonous, explosive, and environmentally hazardous. Users coming down from this intense high suffer from delusions, depression, and paranoia. They often effect, react violently and unpredictably to those around them. Methamphetamine's effects slice across the fabric of our community. Individuals using meth suffer physical and mental dissipation. Families disintegrate in its wake. We found toddlers sleeping and playing in direct prox proximity to tox toxic clandestine meth labs. Children in our grade schools have been cut with methamphetamine in their possession. Neighborhoods are alarmed by meth cooks, dealers, and their customers. Our wilderness areas and campgrounds have been defaced by meth cooks dumping their toxic wastes. Rental owners have had their properties devalued by the re results of meth labs in their units. Rental houses where meth lab has been produced have been demolished because it was simply too costly to renovate the property. Our community's quality of life has been degraded by methamphetamine production and use. The costs of dealing with the problem are immense. A Portland, Oregon Police Bureau study revealed that 80% of their fraud, forgery, and identity theft cases were related to the use and production of methamphetamine Fraud, forgery, and identity theft are our fastest growing crime category, costing tens of millions of dollars in our, in our three-state three region. 
Clark County government is spending millions of dollars in the criminal justice system, the social service system, the medical community, the mental health community, and substance abuse treatment community that can be directly attributed to the production, sale, and abuse of methamphetamine. Let me close with a thank you to our federal government. Uh, inclusion of Southwest Washington and Northwest high intensity drug trafficking areas viewed by our law enforcement agencies as a ray of hope. COPS grants give us manpower that we would not otherwise have to, to be able to address this issue. Burn grant dollars are the backbone of our Clark's Comania Drug Task Force. We would not be able to continue our efforts at their current level without them. Burn grant dollars have funded 60% of all drug prosecutions in Clark County. Your infusion of money in the form of meth initiative dollars have enabled us to support a multidisciplinary group of professionals across our state and in our community to combat the production and use of methamphetamine, methamphetamine in innovative ways. The return of these dollars to our community has been essential. We've used them effectively to combat this growing and vexing plague on our community. Uh, and I'd end with a plea, and that is please keep our Northwest Hyatt a burn grant meth initiative and treatment dollars uh, flowing to the law enforcement, education, prevention, and mental health uh, agencies in our local communities to help us address this problem. Well, I thank you each for the uh, long travel you've made to come here uh, to give testimony on uh, what, generally speaking, we, we try to have a a meth hearing at least probably this is our second or third one in a period of three or four years. So you're rare participants, but important participants in a process as we uh, continue to gather the information on how to approach the meth question. Um, let me ask um, each of you uh, to respond. I'm going to cluster a couple of questions together. And then, um, well actually, before I get into that, I, I have a, a couple of uh, uh, technical questions. Um, that I want to get on the record before I get into some policy questions. You saw the chart uh, earlier that showed the uh, number of, of labs. And in the Washington State number, it was 1417. The number uh, I believe you used, Chief, was 1310. Do you know where that? The, the, yeah, yes, sir. The, yeah. the 13350 is from 2001, and I believe okay. the DEA's numbers are from 2002, and those are c consistent with what we think the numbers would be. Um, but our numbers, uh, the, the source of our numbers is from the Washington State Sheriff's and Chiefs Association. And uh, do all your labs go into EPIC and count, or if that was the previous year, do you, th you said you think it's consistent with, do you think you could actually be up to 1,700 or... Uh, could you talk a little bit, you heard us earlier talking about yes. the difficulty of collecting at the local level and then yes. going to the it, and, and that is a long time difficult process uh, problem across the United States. I would say that our numbers are probably um, uh, pretty close to the DEAs, but I would also say that there, 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 will, there is no way that I think anyone knows of right now to make them absolutely consistent because of reporting errors. That's been a common traditional problem in law enforcement uh, for my entire career and understanding from uh, Sheriff Lucas that, that goes beyond my start of a career. Um, my guess and, and my, uh, my information from being involved with the Western States Information Network and EPIC and some of the other narcotics enforcement intelligence sources is that some of those numbers are underreported. I can tell you from personal experience that the Oregon numbers seem to be very much underreported that were indicated on the DEA board, and that's typical. I spent 14 years in law enforcement there, and they don't have the reporting systems up to speed with EPIC that Washington State does. So um, I, th I think our numbers are accurate, but I can't answer you because we had such short notice as to whether um, they're exact. Captain Kelly, do you have any comment on the? <clears throat> you know, I would agree, uh, Congressman. Uh, we pay attention to the stats. I mean, we certainly do. Um, and uh, but there is no universal reporting mechanism nor mandate. And I'll, I'll highlight this for you. Um, you saw some numbers that were posted up there by the DEA in 2002 uh, with respect to Missouri. And Missouri's seen a, a huge increase. Uh, from about 900 reportable labs in 2000 to more than 2,100 in 2001. So I was curious about this, so I went and did the research on this. And what happened in the state of Missouri was they came up with a mandated reporting law. Um, but 
what do they distinguish? Uh, is it a box lab? Is it just flasks? Uh, is it a super lab? Or are they reporting just everything? Are they reporting the Beavis and, well, let me put it this way, the mom and pop one, um, small lab, or are they reporting the super lab? And uh, so they're reporting everything. And uh, there is no universal system. That is good for the state of Missouri that they do that because they can track it. I wish we all did that, but we don't. So there, it would be nice to have a, a mandated reporting system with some definitive guidelines, and that way we could track the stats better. Pursuing that a uh, little bit, uh, uh, Sheriff Lucas, without um, and getting into a broader question, um, mandatory reporting laws are, are one way that things would be different. Um, when a county like Clark County becomes highly aware of their problem, uh, how much of this do you think is an actual increase in meth usage versus now you're aware of it, you're tracking it closer, your officers have been trained to look for it. Um, and uh, another way to ask that, so that's part A. Part B is, is it as severe in the counties around Clark? And if not, why not? Uh, would it be that they're not focused on it as much? Or is it, in fact, as severe? Um, well, <coughs> we have been aware of the methamphetamine problem, as I pointed out, since the 1970s. So. Uh, growth is not attributable to the fact that all of a sudden we became aware and started counting. We've been counting for a long time and the numbers continue to go up and up and up and up. Secondly, we're in kind of a unique position because uh, we are the population center for southwest Washington and the, the counties that surround us, uh, Skamania County, for example, has a population of about 13,000, I want to say, 15,000. <coughs> Cowlitz County, uh, probably greater than that, probably in the 75,000 figure in Waukiacum County, uh, similar to Skamania County. So uh, we are the population center located directly across the river from Portland. And, and uh, But would not, uh, from what we heard earlier from Arkansas, and this is kind of different, and in my home area, which would have a similar, the city of Fort Wayne's bigger than the city of Vancouver, the county is roughly the same, but then when you move out of Allen County, you drop to about counties of, of 30,000, but we see the number of meth labs actually increasing as you move out from the city. Is that true, and why wouldn't it be moving into some of those rural areas? Uh, actually, they become dump, dumping grounds and a manufacturing uh, spots because a lessly populated counties often have fewer officers to be able to deal with the problem. Uh, it's more difficult to discover their operation and dumping their toxic wastes is much easier. And, it, and uh, following up uh, with that, and then I want to do the same thing for, for Sacramento, uh, that um, uh, one of the things that's fairly arbitrary, we have this problem uh, a little bit as we looked at our southwest border, Haida, that, uh, and we're trying to address that in the new ONDCP bill, uh, a little bit, but New Mexico State Police and New Mexico agencies view it as New Mexico and Arizona views their border as Arizona and California as California and Texas as Texas, whereas the cartels are much more fluid. And I'm wondering how this deals around state lines. In my, in, in my area, uh, Fort Wayne is dominant, but clearly as a shopping region, as a TV region, as everything else, Western Ohio moves in, Southern Michigan moves in. In your area, it has to be even more pronounced with Portland. Um, uh, do you have, uh, in when you do regional task force things or when you look at a problem like meth or heroin or cocaine or marijuana, uh, uh, ecstasy, do you pull towards Portland or are you pulled up towards Seattle because you're part of the state of Washington? There are several distribution routes that uh, flow along the west coast. I-5 is the main distribution channel. Uh, goes into the Tri-Cities area, into the Yakima area, and, it, and north into Vancouver, B.C. through Seattle. And uh, we try to coordinate our efforts with DEA. Uh, our Clark's Community Drug Task Force uh, is connected with WISN. Uh, we attempt to do our interdiction efforts. Uh, our efforts have led us, led us into California and California folks have developed cases in Clark County and 
and on up into Vancouver, British Columbia. So the law enforcement network is fairly well tied together Do and you, attempting to Is Vancouver the considered part of the Portland SMSA, the Standard Statistical Metropolitan Area? Yes, uh, I believe so. Th do you have anybody who sits on any drug task force in Portland or on any HIDA in Portland, or do you sit on all the, the Washington things but coordinate then with Oregon? <coughs> Either. The answer is, is we do both. We actually have an officer assigned to a DEA task force that is the liaison to our drug task force. He works out of Portland with that task force, and they go back and forth. Um, Sheriff Lucas and I are on some drug advisory committees, including the ATTF um, task force over in Portland. Um, we do draw into Portland. I mean, that's a big part of our trafficking goes across the, the border there, but the fact is the I-5 corridor is our main route and it goes from one end of the country to the other and affects us very much so. Let me ask uh, uh, another Washington question. Is the, do you see much uh, swapping of your meth for BC bud? In other words, what we're hearing from Canada is whenever they, they're sell, obviously selling, uh, to, let me quote customs, if they see somebody with a hockey bag coming across the border, they assume it's B.C. Bud. Um, now, they're not just coming to live in the United States with B.C. Bud. They're usually walking back with cocaine, sometimes heroin, and the question is, are they taking any meth back or is meth not <coughs> transited that way? I don't have any specific knowledge that would relate to your question. Yeah. And I, I'm not aware of methamphetamine being traded for that either. Okay, and are your precursors, um, particularly for your larger labs, are they coming from Vancouver, Canada, the other Vancouver? Yes. That's the, the, large, the, the large, large volume of, yeah. of, of ephedrine uh, principally are coming from yes. Canada. Have you, either of you, had any cases where uh, we had one case that was being closely investigated in one of my counties where uh, a biker gang had actually sent somebody through pharmacy school and had set up a traditional pharmacy which became the laundering agent. Have you seen any of that penetration into the pharmacy community where they could actually feed the local labs? What, what we see more commonly is because we don't have as tight a precursor laws as say California does, um, they don't have to put someone into the chemical companies. They, they, are, they are able to get large amounts of precursor chemicals through legitimate companies because of the lack of awareness and the lack of uh, legislative authority to stop that. Um, that's most common. I, I have not personally, I don't think our drug task force has seen that. In, in the state of Washington, however, we have investigated and are investigating several internet um, supplies. Uh, Captain Kelly, in California, uh, the, your Sacramento County, could you, do you give a little bit of the population with that and, and the nature of the territory that you're working with? Sacramento County uh, is about uh, 1,000 square miles. It's uh, pretty much heavily populated. Uh, population is about uh, 2 million uh, within that general Sacramento County area and the uh, outlying areas of Placer County, El Dorado, and Yolo. Um, Sacramento County being the uh, the hub of uh, both Highway 50, Highway 80, I-5, and also the Sacramento River, the ports, um, and also having the Delta where we have a lot of migrant workers. Uh, we have our rural portions out there where those are where our super labs would be. Uh, we also have the uh, International Airport, and um, so we're a major hub for transportation distribution. and. Uh, it's interesting you brought up the exchange of coke for uh, BC Bud, and uh, we just finished a case with that, uh, where there was an exchange of BC Bud down through the I-5 corridor, uh, and we just nailed somebody transporting 75 kilos up to uh, up to Canada in exchange for that. So it's a major, major distribution route. In the um, in in the earlier discussions where we talked about um, meth predominantly being a rural phenomena. Uh, why do you think the Central Valley has evolved differently and a major metropolitan area has evolved differently? Take it through the steps on that, sir. Uh, methamphetamine uh, can be produced, and you, know, you brought up earlier about uh, how it's easily found on the Internet, and I brought this with me. Uh, I printed this out on the Internet the other day. Uh, it's easy to find this stuff um, about how to produce methamphetamine. Within the cities, uh, within uh, heavily populated areas, 
you, uh, you have a difficult time making large quantities of methamphetamine because of the odors, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the physical hazards of taking the chemicals, the supplies, and everything into a heavily populated area. So you get your smaller labs uh, and your different methodologies, such as the, uh, the Birch, the Nazi methodology, the different methodologies uh, that these meth users, meth cookers, um, make, their, uh, make their product. As you get into the outlying areas and you start getting into the super labs, uh, you've got more vacant area, more rural area, where uh, the chemicals aren't as detectable. There's um, availability of chemicals from the farmlands where they can go rip these farmers off for their anhydrous ammonia. Um, and then they can set up shop out there in some rural portion of the field and uh, they'll cook 20, 40, 60, 100 pounds of meth within uh, a 24 hour period, they dump the chemicals into the groundwater, into the ecological supply, they're on the road, and so is 100 pounds of meth, plain and simple. Uh, within, the, within the cities, you just can't do that, so you get the smaller labs. So the more rural the area, the larger labs you'll get. And then, uh, of course, generally, the, uh, uh, the Mexican nationals uh, and the migrant workers sometimes uh, are more or less associated with the cooking portions of it and uh, they kind of avoid, um, you know, the heavily populated areas. Uh, either they can't live there, uh, they can't afford to live there, they can't find jobs there, something like that. Uh, but it's not all Mexican nationals, that's just, it predominates that. In the, is Sierra National Forest close to you? Yes, it is. They, they, wasn't that where they found the heroin poppy growing? Yes, it is. Uh, very close to, uh, that's interesting too, but uh, yes, very close, about 60 miles away from Sacramento. Growing poppies here in the state of California other than the state flower. Unbelievable. Is, is that part of the, the uh, giant uh, labs in your area, the super labs, the, the uh, heroin, the, uh, the quantity of BC bud, the coke bus that you talked about, is, is Sacramento a hub because you have a number of these national forests and open areas around it, and then they move through Sacramento to move to other parts of the United States. Is, uh, is that why in the Central Valley, what would be the other major hubs? Would Modesto and Fresno have similar things? Or? And they do, they, and they abut up to uh, the Yosemite Valley and, uh, and, those, uh, and the national forests and the parks. Um, I don't know that they, they will go to the rural areas, and the more rural, the better, the more likely they're not gonna get detected. Um, and so if they can't get into those parks, you know, they certainly will go into those parks, but uh, there's still enough rural land within the state of California and within any of the states, I think, uh, that uh, they can always find their little niche where they're gonna make their dope. Because according to this DEA chart, there's 191 super labs that they had reported through EPIC, 159 of which were California, which right. means that if those super labs were accounting, as they said, for 70% of mess sales in the United States, it means that, that California's uh, uh, somewhere around uh, 60 percent, 58 to 60 percent of all the meth in the United States is coming, and most of that from the Central Valley. Is that not correct? I, there's a lot of meth generated uh, and cooked in, uh, in Southern California, too. Uh, you, know, you don't have the deserts. You have rural farmland and everything. Uh, I can highlight, uh, within the last year and a half, we've seized up in the Central Valley in the North State uh, 250 labs. Now, those are actual cooking labs. I'm not talking dump sites. I'm not talking pseudoephedrine reductions. I'm talking actual 250 labs. And out of those, uh, 45 of them were super labs. They were capable of producing more than 10 pounds in one cook. It's about 18 percent. And that seems to be about the number, um, you know, 18, 20, low 20 percent is the number of super labs in comparison to the other labs that are found. That was just your county? Yeah, well, that was actually just my program uh, oh. for about an 18-month period, so. Okay, Mr. Uh, Baird has joined us. I told him you were gonna give him this sterling uh, introduction, so if you wanna add anything to the introduction or have any comments or questions. Well, uh, I wanna thank the chairman and apologize to my good friends from back home. Uh, they're familiar, we have a area called Camp Bonneville, which is literally coming to a head at the exact same time this hearing was scheduled, plus votes on the floor. My humble apologies, but I just could not be both places at once. But uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I want to thank the chairman for inviting uh, all three of these individuals, I think it's so important for us to hear from people on the ground uh, who deal with this every day. I've done ride-alongs with the, the officers' uh, uh, crew. They do a great job. 
but, but one of the things I think they might help us understand in the, in the committee and, and in the Congress is, is the added cost and, and burden of, of bringing down a meth site versus, let's say somebody's got a marijuana operation or, or, or dealing with heroin or cocaine. What if they could talk about some of the added things, and particularly uh, both in terms of financial cost, but also risk to your to your officers uh, uh, being exposed to the toxins and and the possible explosive environment, et cetera. And I wonder if if any of the three could could enlighten us about that. What kind of challenge does it face your 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 officers on the street physically in terms of safety, and what are the economic uh, implications of, of those extra uh, hazards and costs? Well, there. <clears throat> uh, there are uh, extreme costs associated to, I would call them extreme costs associated to uh, law enforcement when it comes to meth and meth labs because of the equipment needed um, for each officer to be able to go in. The dangers are many, and I think the, the, that the captain would be better to tell that part of it, but I will just say this, is that in every case that we go into a house, the potential for a meth lab to be behind the door is there. And the volatility of the chemicals used in the, pr in the process um, is always life-threatening when someone goes through the door. And most of the time, unless we have a search warrant for a meth lab, they're going through not necessarily knowing whether there's a meth lab on the other side. Now, it is true that the, most of the meth labs that we're talking about are not super lab um, uh, sized, but the end result of an explosion or the chemicals that could permeate someone's skin are nonetheless uh, dangerous to our officers. The training, I, I said this before in, in my statement, but the training uh, and the equipment that it c takes to just outfit the hazmat teams and the police officers that routinely go into these meth labs is, is very burdensome. And again, if we didn't have the funding that we get from the DEA or from the federal government, along with our agency's budgeting, uh, we wouldn't be able to make it. And we are getting to that point of where we're breaking. Um, we, we have been fortunate to get uh, some funding in that area through Homeland Defense dollars and some other uh, avenues, but uh, we are, at least for my agency, we are way behind in getting our patrol officers and those who may run into that accidentally every day uh, equipped to the level that they need to be. Thank you. We, one of the things, Mr. Chairman, we've worked on in the Meth Caucus has been legislation we essentially refer to as the Meth Mask legislation because our firefighters have rebreathing apparatuses, et cetera, and they can go in. Oftentimes, our, our frontline uh, police and sheriff, they're just going in, breathing in these terribly dangerous chemicals, and they've got to secure the area, sometimes wrestle with perpetrators, and uh, they're exposed that whole time. So we believe there's a need for additional support for our local law enforcement officers, and we've modeled this along the lines of the uh, body armor legislation, wherein local law enforcement agencies can apply for uh, uh, grants to help provide basic uh, protective equipment to protect their officers on the street. And uh, from what we hear, it would be a, a tremendous help. And, uh, 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 be interested in Captain Kelly's comments or, or Sheriff Lucas. Uh, I just would say that there are training costs that are associated with people that we send into meth labs and with line level officers who may encounter a box lab on the street. There's the PE, PPE, the personal protective equipment that uh, we have to issue uh, for responders. There are baseline and ongoing medical examinations that you have to that you have to provide for people who are entering meth labs on a regular basis. There, there are the cleanup costs that are associated with the lab itself, and then there are the are there property renovation costs uh, that are associated with a, a lab cleanup uh, that normally the private property owner has to bear. Uh, if we go in and, and take down a lab, the costs are significantly more. Uh, if we go in and clean up a, a marijuana grow, we go in, we hot, whack down the pimp plants, we throw them in a bag, we take them off, and we're done. Uh, so is the property owner. But when we take down a meth lab, uh, the steps are significantly different. Okay. Uh, they've, uh, I believe, hit on just about anything that I could touch on other than uh, once you establish a, an officer and these trainees equipped or she, um, to investigate a uh, clandestine lab, you know, there's recertification training ongoing, fit testing for their mask, uh, baseline testing uh, medically. Sacramento County, you may have a labor organization that may say, hey, those deputies or those officers who investigate 
clandestine laboratories get a 10 percent hazard pay. So those are additional burdens upon a department through a collective bargaining process. Uh, but certainly uh, um, it's expensive. It's expensive to do so. It's expensive to take care of the officer and it's expensive to take care of a drug and danger child. So. Thank you. Uh, perhaps this was addressed in your earlier comments. I've, I've heard some uh, uh, very high numbers in terms of the estimate of the contribution in one fashion or another of methamphetamine to the overall crime problem, be it identity theft, I think uh, you may have addressed that earlier. Any estimate in terms of what either direct or indirect portion of our crime problem, be it burglary, robbery, identity theft, uh, et cetera, homicides, we've got a, some huge, ter terrific homicides in our district uh, with this. Any estimate of that or sense of it? I, I, we had a, a quote from Portland Police Bureau that they felt like eight, over 80 percent of their criminal activity that they recorded was attributed to um, methamphetamine. Um, I don't. I have anecdotal evidence and certainly don't have any hard fact data, but I think it is um, not an understatement to say that most of the crime that we see in the Vancouver area uh, is directly attributable to drug abuse, uh, including alcohol abuse. Uh, and I would say a majority of that is related to methamphetamine. Uh, certainly, without doubt, uh, this spike in ID theft and uh, uh, fraud related to that is absolutely um, attributable to methamphetamine uh, users and dealers and methamphetamine organizations who use it as a way of funding either for uh, to buy the, the drugs or to buy the precursors to make the drugs. There's no question about that. Do you drug test people you arrest? Uh, we, we do have some ability to drug test. We don't drug test everyone. Um, we aren't very good at keeping those kind of statistics um, on the front end. Now, the jail does some, some testing and the hospitals do some testings um, that uh, we are just now starting to talk about doing a better job of getting hard data so that when we talk about these things, it's not just anecdotal. Um, but we, we don't, as a Vancouver Police Department, drug test. Do you in the prison? What's that? Do you, uh, for prisoners, uh, do you drug test and is meth included in that kind of drug test? Some prisoners. Um, I guess that I would uh, attempt to address the 80 percent figure that uh, because fraud, forgery and identity theft is such a huge issue, uh, Portland Police Bureau and its law enforcement partners uh, in the region have gone together to attempt to form a regional center for the investigation of economic crime. And as a, uh, some, one of the first steps in, in forming the center, uh, tried to relate uh, various criminal patterns to, patterns to, uh, to each other. And their 80% figure said that 80% of their fraud, forgery, and identity theft uh, cases were directly related to methamphetamine, 90 percent if you included cocaine in the mix. Man. Wow. Captain Kelly, do you uh, drug test or uh, in a, as a pattern, do you test for different drugs or do you have to have somebody who was busted on a drug charge in order to do that or how do you pursue that? It would depend on their history, uh, but there have been programs uh, within our jail systems, uh, our uh, main jail downtown, uh, such as the, uh, the Adam Project, uh, the uh, California Alcohol and Drug Data, where we've uh, interviewed or taken tests, and pretty much that's on a on a uh, voluntarily or volunteer nature. Uh, what we do have, and, and perhaps I could send each one of you this, is our first year of our CalMet report. We actually did some statistics whereby we went out and tried to capture um, arrests, narcotics, uh, emergency room admissions, and actually deaths uh, related to. To different narcotics, um, and certainly methamphetamine uh, was off the scale. Um, second, believe it or not, was marijuana and hash. Hmm. So. Um, it, uh, one of the questions I like to ask when we have an opportunity to have on the line people uh, who face these problems every day is if there were a couple of things, if you could, could pick two or three ways in which the federal government would, could help. And often, obviously, it's partly possibly financial support. But there are sometimes other things. I hear about flexibility in the use of funds. I hear about coordination. If there were two, one of the ways in our area I know is in, we've got a great uh, uh, 
a U.S. attorney who's finally bringing U.S. attorney presence. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you commented on the relationship between Portland and Vancouver. One of the challenges we face there is that if you commit a certain drug crime across the river, it's a federal offense. It's still a federal offense on our side of the river, but we haven't had the, the resources. And having worked in prisons myself, they know this stuff. They know that if they rob a bank in Portland, Oregon, they're doing federal time. If they rob a bank in Vancouver, Washington, they're doing state time, if any. And uh, this drives these poor folks crazy because the robbers come to our side of the river. They commute. Uh, but the original question is, if we could do two or three things, you know, given that money's finite, what would they be to help on the line law enforcement the most to deal with this particular problem? Well, from, from my perspective, Congressman, <clears throat> you hit the nail on the head that U.S. Attorney, uh, federal courthouse, and uh, um, federal law enforcement support and assistance located in Southwest Washington is by far number one in terms of having the judicial system in place to help us with these larger organizations. Uh, the second thing would be uh, funding for training and equipment for our personnel. And third, absolutely of equal importance would be uh, dollars for treatment, prevention, and education, um, because without that multidisciplinary approach, we are going to be chasing our tails. Law enforcement cannot be the only approach to this problem. That's well said. Sheriff, any? Amen. <laughs> Uh, my sheriff would probably tell you to send him the money and uh, he'll take <laughs> care of it. But uh, certainly, uh, as I highlighted earlier, um, the personnel costs are, are extremely expensive and that is a, a finite um, consideration here. When you look at the overall problem, uh, there's education, there's treatment, there's mutual cooperation. Uh, perhaps what we ought to do is take a look at, uh, at some of the requirements to bring a case forward from a local law enforcement agency to the OSADEF level and looking at OSADEF reimbursements. Um, I know that uh, the HIDAs uh, are uh, transitioning some of their thought process into um, um, making them OSADEF cities on the larger scale, whereas the Central Valley HIDA um, I believe that uh, Bill Ruzumenti, the director of the Central Valley HIDA, would sit here and tell you that uh, that $1.5 million uh, that would be sent to the, uh, the San Francisco area would be better spent in the Central Valley, whereby he can, he can put it to use, um, uh, expanding his HIDA and uh, gaining other counties into the HIDA. Uh, mandated reporting and consistent uh, statistical reporting uh, and evaluation and an expansion of the precursor vendor and intelligence program. Um, those, are, those are some things that uh, I believe would be, would, would serve law enforcement's best interest. Uh, I'd just comment, it's a wonderful thing to have f folks who are, when, when something's been said, just say amen. Uh, the, the practice here is to say it yourself only longer. <laughs> so I appreciate succinct, but also I think very uh, uh, relevant and helpful comments. I don't have further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, I also wanted to ask, uh, uh, Chief uh, Hartnick, uh, that you had in your uh, testimony that DEA gave you training and, and funding, and in the written statement from DEA, we heard a little bit about what they do for training. What funding stream do they have then to help uh, you beyond the training? Be beyond the training, and the training, all of our drug enforcement agents go through the DEA drug school and, and also through the meth lab cleanup um, school so that they can be certified, but the, but the funding is for cleanup of meth labs. Um, there are cases where we can uh, get the DEA involved in uh, our meth lab investigations and they will actually be involved to the point where they use DEA funds to help clean those labs up. So it's because it's a tie through the task force and it becomes a task force funded through DEA. It's not money they give to local police departments to do it. No, it's just like federalizing that's right. a crime if you can get a yes, sir. task force to yes, federalize sir. a crime. That, that is exactly right. The um, other way they help us is that they bring resources to the table that we don't have. When we, many times when we're chasing our local crooks, they lead us to in the, up the supply chain. And when we get to a certain point in the supply chain, it's very helpful to be able to call DEA and say, we have a case, these are the facts, these are, these are the people, can you help us? And many times they come to our assistance with money and resources that we couldn't possibly put together. You heard me say uh, earlier in this hearing that um, we're going to be focusing on prevention and treatment. And uh, if you have specific cases, because both of your areas uh, have dealt with this issue and are 
two of arguably the four hardest hit meth areas in the United States, of programs in the schools that target either to a particular group or subgroups on meth that seem to be working on prevention and on treatment. Now, uh, I want to give you a warning as we go th through this type of thing that just like a lot of people say, uh, oh, why should we be focused, why don't we just give up on the drug war? It's not working. Uh, they don't say that as much on child abuse and spouse abuse, and they aren't eliminated either. I mean, this is a tough problem. We're never going to eliminate it. But a lot of times we hear, well, the prevention and treatment are the hope. We have to be pursuing all ends, but as you know, many of the people, if not everybody you're arresting, has been through multiple treatment programs. I've very seldom anybody who hadn't been through five or six. Um, and how do we find out which ones are effective? We know some of that's insurance reasons. We know some of it is they haven't really made an internal commitment. So what kind of programs help them make an internal commitment in their head, uh, a head and heart commitment as opposed to just a law commitment or a family forced them to go in? What kind of treatment? And then are there treatment programs that can specify uh, more in detail on meth that are because you've been tracking this longer, you have that longer, are there treatment programs that specialize in meth in your area that we might, as it spreads around across the United States and as we put people in treatment, that we might highlight as examples? Similar in prevention, um, and um, uh, that we are always looking for creative ways to do this. These are a little bit different markets that we've dealt with, um, and uh, in reality, we're, uh, it would not necessarily be a program that focuses solely on meth because we all know it's a polybrug, just like we heard one of, one of the other things we're trying to do, our document individual cases. Part of the reason I ask you whether you measure is we hear these numbers, but at the same time, when you read a report of an accident, you often don't hear was high on marijuana. You may see the alcohol, because often we test for the alcohol, but in many cases, we don't even test for uh, uh, meth, ecstasy, uh, LSD, uh, unless there's a reason to suspect these tests are expensive for cocaine and heroin. Therefore, people think, oh, we don't have a drug problem, we have an alcohol problem. You have a poly drug problem in many cases. And, and this mix and the alcohol becomes even more potent when mixed with the other drugs, including this really high-grade marijuana. So the degree that, that you have some prevention or treatment programs in your area as, as two of the kind of hardest hit meth areas of the country, we very much uh, appreciate that. Also, uh, Captain Kelly, and we'll be working with, with uh, uh, Chairman Osi too, to um, look at, I remember when we were in the Sacramento area with a hearing, um, the initial, we had the family with the initial, the lab that blew up and the little girl that started the lab law and the child abuse law in California for any additional information if you want to submit that some here of how that child abuse law has worked in California on um, helping you in law enforcement uh, and in prevention and education areas in the community on that. It would be helpful to get it in this hearing's record as well. And also, uh, we heard you have uh, 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 tough uh, precursor laws. If you could tell us a little bit how you've tightened those up and for the record and, and so we can show what impact that might have had and how we move it. You also used the example of the Atlanta case mm -hmm. in the major lab. Um, we'll, get, we'll give you some of these in a, in a printed form, too. But because you've had so much activity in, in the Central Valley area, some of the specifics uh, of some other cases like that Atlanta case where you think some of this super lab stuff is being distributed. Uh, I also I comment on, yeah. in response to what you've just uh, in, in the issue of treatment, uh, particularly on meth, uh, gentlemen, I know mentioned the officers mentioned our Washington State Meth Initiative. One of the things that's fund funded that we're very proud of is a meth moms program, uh, which we've now got two programs working, where moms who've uh, been uh, uh, found to be using meth are basically faced uh, with losing their kids, and they they are required by the courts to go through both a meth treatment and a parenting program. So. A lot of times, they're just rotten parents, and they don't necessarily know it because they're so focused on meth. Uh, I've met with these folks, been to the program, and they are getting some graduates out who it's tremendously gratifying to watch them actually learn to parent. As one woman said, uh, I thought I was being a good parent, but now that I've gone through this, I've come to realize top ramen noodles every night are not exactly a balanced meal. And she just was raised in a culture and by parents who hadn't trained her well 
and didn't know how to parent and simultaneously was then hooked on meth, what we're finding is they're not only coming out staying clean off the meth, they're coming out and they've got some pretty good parenting skills and at least with some of these folks, we may finally break this cycle because as I'm sure the officers know and I used to see it in my clinical work as a psychologist, you see this just heartbreaking chain of people hooked on meth, terrible parenting skills, hooking their own kids on it and creating just further cycles. So this Meth Moms program has been very effective. The other thing that uh, I think we've done some good work on is integration of law enforcement. I believe Vancouver and Clark County do this. I know Olympia does it. Integration be with uh, Child Protective Services and our hospitals so that you've got uh, pedi pediatricians and Child Protective Service workers working hand in hand with law enforcement. One of our programs, the CPS worker is right there, right after the bust, goes in with the teddy bears and stuff, not only takes the kids out, but takes them to foster parents who have been trained in meth. So you've got the whole cycle. The kid's now taken from the parents. The parents are incarcerated. They go get a full, thorough physical from doctors who know about the <laughs> impacts of meth. And then when they're placed, they're placed in a foster home where the foster parents have been trained in meth. And, and I don't know if you want to comment or if there's time, but those kind of programs, I think, are working pretty well. Do you have any additional comment on that? Uh, not really. But I, again, I, my personal bias is a toward an accountability model uh, in my years in law enforcement and observing uh, folks that have been uh, involved in treatment programs. The closer the supervision, the tighter the accountability, in my opinion, the more likely the individual is to make, is, is to say safely and uh, make it out the other end of the treatment program uh, relatively successful. I think it was also helpful because often we forget the, the U.S. attorney angle and if you don't have uh, the prisons, if you don't have the U.S. attorneys to prosecute, if you don't have the U.S. marshals to move the people, um, the whole system starts to break down. And we heard this also in northern Washington at Blaine uh, in Congressman Larson's district uh, as he was getting in that county flooded in a very small county with people coming across from uh, Vancouver. So uh, thank you for that testimony too. Thank you for all your frontline work uh, and for taking the time to come here to the other Washington and the other coast uh, to uh, share with us your grassroots experience and hopefully we can incorporate these ideas into our uh, meth bill and as we move forward in the other uh, areas as well. With that, the subcommittee hearing stands adjourned. Live Saturday on Book TV from New York City, the fifth annual Harlem Book Fair. All day coverage begins at noon Eastern with panels on activism, the aftermath of 9 11, the black book industry, and more. And panelists including Deborah Mathis, Walter Mosley, Bell Hooks.